Welcome to the Sound of Design with Mark and Dan. And uh, <laughs> we are very excited to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it has been uh, a lot of fun doing these, and uh, hopefully you guys have a lot of fun uh, hanging out with us as well. I uh, want to do a quick shout out and a quick thank you to folks in Australia, uh, Netherlands, Egypt, uh, Colombia. Uh, we've got uh, listeners in Wales. Uh, just want to say thank you to everybody who's been listening overseas. Uh, really, really, really appreciate it. We're glad you're joining us, and uh, hopefully you're getting a lot out of this. Uh, also want to say thank you to uh, everybody who submitted questions. Uh, we've got more that have come in, but we uh, will not get to those today. We're going to do those on a future episode. Uh, but just want to say thank you again for uh, sending those. Uh, feel free to keep uh, reaching out to us, and uh, we will get back to you as we can. So today, how are you doing, Mark? <laughs> I'm good. How are you, Dan? <laughs> doing awesome. Uh, how do you feel about talking about sound problems today? Sound problems. That's, uh, <laughs> you mean we could just give someone some sound advice around sound problems? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was good anyway, or bad. It might be. Uh, we'll see. It, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about acoustics today. Uh, right. So uh, the uh, main issues or the main problems that uh, happen when you talk about sound in a room, uh, that's going to be kind of the focus. We'll get into a little bit about um, what are those issues. We'll talk about um, what are some of the solutions, specifically the types of panels. We'll get into some of those. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about placement. We'll talk a little bit about the room itself, um, talking about uh, the way that a room is designed, whether it's in a home or in a professional application. Um, we'll get into uh, some cool stories uh, regarding some of the things that uh, we've done. And uh, we've got some really cool things if you're going to be building um, and there's uh, or remodeling. There are some things that you can do to really dramatically improve uh, the acoustics and uh, the sound isolation uh, in your home and the sonic experience in your home. So to uh, kick it off, Mark, why don't we begin with uh, what are some of the biggest problems that we run into with acoustics? Um, and uh, specifically when it comes to doing anything, whether it's music or movies, uh, what are the what are the the problem issues that we have to solve for? Yeah, it's um, we kind of touched on it last week a little bit, but um, it's just kind of the the design of the room itself. Um, a lot of architects are 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 kind of uh, really bringing in a lot of different decors from the past, and also kind of being a little bit more forward thinking. So I know like a lot of the homes would you and I walk into, whether it's a even if it's a dedicated theater something along those lines, it's usually got some sort of weird ceiling, whether it's a coffered ceiling or a tray ceiling or a vaulted ceiling. You know, I say weird. It's just an architecturally sound yeah. ceiling or design. So uh, what is that going to do for the sound in the room? It's going to it's going to cause problems. It's going to cause reflection points. It's going to, you know, if it's a vaulted ceiling, it means you've got a you're going to probably have to turn it up a little bit louder if you're just going to utilize, you know, an empty space. So um, we typically work alongside some of our uh, acoustic uh, vendors or acoustic panel vendors to kind of uh, adjust for those um, imperfections in the space. Yep, absolutely. And it's one of those things that you have to <laughs> sort of know intuitively because you don't always get a chance to just have the conversation about it because it doesn't always come up unless there's a problem. Right. And right. so it's kind of like if you've ever been to a larger home with a big grand, uh, you know, 30 foot ceiling and it's, you know, got that vaulted ceiling to your, which, you, what you were talking about before. Yeah. That's going to be just like a gymnasium. There's going to be a lot of echo. There's going to be, uh, a lot of what we would call reverb, 
right? Um, yep. And how many bands do you know? And I'm sure that you've heard the stories, right? The Led Zeppelins, you know, renting out a big mansion and they put a drum kit at the bottom of the stairs <laughs> and the microphones yep. at the top of this. Like, and what are they doing getting this massive drum hits, these huge, you know, kick drum sounds? And why do they sound so big? Well, because they're in this huge space. So if you could just mm -hmm. sort of imagine this echo, right? And when we say the words reflections, right? Um, what we're really talking about is where a sound hits a wall and then bounces back on itself. There's nothing to stop it, right? It's why think of it just like wind, just like water. Like you can't get any, if there's nothing in the way, then you're, you're, you're just going to continue with that energy, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To take a physics approach, object in motion stays in motion, that kind of a concept. Um, and so you mentioned uh, the vendors, right? So let's mm -hmm. maybe take a problem and a solution. So let's say I've got a bad echo. What would you recommend as a potential solution for echoey or, or bouncy uh, or lively rooms? Sure. So um, the first thing that I typically look, like, look at is going to be kind of where our speakers are located in that space so where is the sound being projected from um so if it's a home theater um we're going to start with the front the front stage so your center your left and right speaker typically more your left and right because those are going to be typically closer to the outside of of the the room towards the closer to a side wall so we'll start there and then we'll place our first acoustic panel on that side wall um, it can be, uh, there's a couple different options. Uh, typically it's a diffuser panel, um, which is not flat. It's actually curved. Now, why do we do that versus a flat? Well, curved panels typically diffuse that sound, uh, a little bit better than a flat panel does. The uh, flat panels are absorbing. So they're kind of that end point. You'd place those at the end point of a space or at the, you know, hanging from a ceiling or on a ceiling, because they're absorbing the sound as it gets to them versus the diffuser is going to be that first reflection point. So it's curved. The signal comes out of the speaker, hits that curved uh, piece, and then is diffused so it doesn't reflect directly back at your listening location. And then every other location is just kind of determined based on the rest of the speakers that you have in the space and how... Um, how you want how much of the room you want to kind of be uh, more dead you know what i mean by that is you know the more the more panels you put in you're gonna get less reflectivity yep well and i'm i'm really glad that uh that you kind of talked about diffusion and absorption and so uh, i always like to tell people diffusers are scattering right so they're yep. going to make your room sound better. And so that round diffuser is really trying to scatter those frequencies in a, in a bunch of different directions. Uh, as opposed to the absorber, you said it correctly. It's the catcher, right? It's just yep. going to absorb that energy and you know hold on to it. It's not going to let that energy go anywhere else in, in the room. And uh, if you've ever looked up pictures of recording studios, you've seen diffusers um, where they have these blocks of wood at different angles. Uh, different shapes, different depths. And the mm -hmm. idea is that they're doing that exact same thing. It's a breakup of the frequency, but not necessarily losing the energy. Um, you can think of it as kind of like um, if you've ever been to the beach and you see those waves crashing in and at the edges, you kind of see this white foam. That's the result of a diffused sound wave. It just kind of breaks up into a million places and it just sort of scatters out just like a wave crashing it up on the beach. It just sort of, you know, cascades away, that kind of an idea. Um, right. Okay, so we've we've got echoes as the problem. And so it looks like um, at that point, we have are either going to diffuse and break them up or we're going to absorb. How many panels would you need in a space? I mean, is this a two thing? Is this a four thing? Is this a 30 thing? Uh, well, yeah, I, I mean... Uh, it, it, it ultimately comes down to your end goal as the end listener, right? So I kind of said it uh, at the end of my last phrase, you know, how how lively do you want the room to be? Now, personally, 
I think I, I, I in in my spaces that I that I like, my ear tends to like a little bit more of a lively room, maybe a little bit of echo. I understand that it's going to affect the sound, but it's just what my ear likes. Um, so if you're uh, designing a space and you tend to like a room that's a little bit more alive, maybe we'll only put, you know, uh, uh, a a third of what we would compared to a full on reference theater where there are zero reflection points or we're trying to eliminate all of the reflections as much as possible or dissipate them. Um, you know, so typically like one of our vendors, they have a level one, a level two and a level three package, you know, level one's going to have, you know, maybe two diffusers and three or four panel absorber panel panels. The level three is going to have, you know, eight absorbers, uh, four clouds, which are absorbers that hang from the ceiling and several diffusers as well. Um, so again, it just kind of comes down to what that end user is. If you're building a recording studio or a reference theater, we're probably going to have multiple diffusers and absorbers for every speaker reflection point. Yep, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you tied it back to the use case because at the end of the day, the level of problem here really is based upon how you use it. And that's true with all technology. You think about it. I mean, a Ferrari is a great car, but if you don't drive, it's not a good piece of technology. <laughs> <laughs> as silly of an, of an example as it is, but like, think about it. You got to have a purpose, right? And that purpose yep. really does define uh, how you approach uh, the space. So yep. uh, we heard, uh, you know, four to six. So let's just say I'm, I'm starting out. And I want to put a couple of absorbers and a couple of diffusers. Um, you know, we want to think about that placement. You mentioned a first reflection point, and I've seen guys with mirrors doing some weird things. Um, you know, mm -hmm. when you say that first reflection point, we're really talking about the wall to the right of the right speaker and mm -hmm. the wall on the left of the left speaker, right? So if you can sort right. of imagine in a room, I got to put something on the wall in order to uh, do that first uh, level of diffusion. So it sounds like the speaker placement then also becomes pretty critical based upon where I'm going to be listening from. Um, Correct. So if I want to have a more lively room where maybe it's like a bonus room, sports room, themed room. It's not really a dedicated theater. Maybe I want maybe a couple of diffusers and that's enough to help give me the sound that I want. And I don't necessarily have to go all the way to the end of the rabbit trail. But if I'm doing a THX reference theater, <laughs> then yeah, maybe we should do the whole room, right? Exactly. No, What's, I agree. Uh, What's what's the idea behind the clouds? You mentioned them briefly. Can you just talk to me a little bit about what a cloud is? Because that seems like I'm I hear that word and I think, you know, uh, I look outside and it's sure. you know, blue skies Fluffy, and white. clouds. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, I mean essentially it's 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 another uh, typically an absorption panel. Um, so like the one that's on the wall behind me, uh, if you're watching the video, uh, it's essentially that, but it's usually hung from the ceiling. Uh, and the low, the drop that it's hung from is basic is going to be designed on where your speaker placement is and how tall your ceiling is. So if I've got, you know, a very high, you know, this is a in my home I've got nine foot ceilings, pretty standard. But if it's a twelve foot ceiling in in this space, you know, they wanted to kind of go for that grander feel. You might drop those clouds, you know, a foot and a half into the room. To, to kind of get those first reflection points from the the center channel speaker and from the left and right speaker because the speaker the sound isn't just going left or right and straight at you it's going all directions right so we need to try to eliminate all of those reflection points including the ones on the ceiling and yep. also the ceiling can collect reflections from any of the other reflections from other speakers so having that is just essentially eliminating those reflection points in the ceiling yep well, and I think everyone at this point is going to say, all right, that sounds all well and good, but I just want to call out maybe one of the distinct uh, audible differences that you'll find when you start putting acoustic panels of any kind into your space, as long as they're done correctly. 
and that is an increase in the stereo imaging of the speaker. And so yep. I want to really kind of paint a picture, which is you are, you know, and if you're driving, don't do this. But if you're at home, <laughs> close your eyes <laughs> and imagine <laughs> that you are at an orchestra uh, concert, okay, and you're sitting in the middle of a huge auditorium. And so in front of you, you've got your violins off to the left and your you know violas are sort of in the front middle as along with those cellos right and then on the right side you've got the big double basses and so you sort of see a stage in front of you and there's more instruments and each one of them is placed appropriately left right left middle middle right middle uh you know far right that kind of an idea far right in the back or far right in the the back left you'll find the timpanis right and so hearing mm -hmm. this sound stage is something that all good speakers can do. So as you put in your diffusion, as you put in your absorbers, what you notice is that it's like somebody putting a magnifying glass on a specific type of instrument. Oh, my goodness. I can hear those violins on the left side. I can hear those basses on the right side. It's mimicking mm -hmm. that live feel, right? Um, yep. just, and how, what would be the benefit, for example, in movies? Cause I know you're more of a movie guy than not to say that you're not a music guy, but sure. I know, you know, no, you, no, you're, you know, a lot. I, yep. You, yeah. You appreciate the movies more than I do. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be kind of that, uh, so think of, of a, a film that you would watch where there's a lot of, um, a lot of sound going on in multiple spaces. So think of an action scene from you know, like a Top Gun or something along those lines where there's a lot of directional surround sound sound effects. Um, if you watch, you know, the, the, we'll bring up the first Top Gun, like the first scene when they're ramping up and they're getting ready to take off of the off of the, the aircraft carrier, uh, you want to hear that plane go from left to right across your room just like you see it on screen. That's how your brain tells you it's supposed to sound. Um and your eyes are telling you, hey, this is what you're supposed to hear. By adding those acoustic treatments, you're able to kind of direct that sound to the ear properly without the sound reflecting off of a wall and maybe hitting both ears or the timing being off. So maybe it's slightly, I don't say slightly delayed, but, you know, that just would be kind of muddy compared to being clean and clear and hearing what the the artist wanted uh, you to hear or intended you to hear as you watch that. So it's, it's kind of the same thing, you know, just instead of it being in timpanis or, you know, some other orchestral instrument, it's whatever sound you should be hearing as you see it happen on screen. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and it's like this idea of going from standard definition to HD and then HD into ultra HD 4k you're mm -hmm. getting this increase in resolution. And I think audio guys use the same terminology sometimes, but they're not really clear about what they mean by it. It's like, no, the sound is more focused. It's tighter. They'll use this type of terminology to tell you, like, you're going to hear things more accurately than you would have otherwise. And that increase in accuracy, by the way, didn't come from the speaker, the wire, mm -hmm. the amp, the processor. <laughs> Right. It came yep. from the benefit of now having a better room. And, you know, we talk about projectors and screens and, you know, compared to televisions. And the big thing with a projector and a screen is that the room is now the in between. Right. It's that piece that is kind of has to be taken into account for the projector and for the screen to operate correctly. And in audio, it's no different. Right. You're going to have the room now part of the equation. All right, so uh, we've talked a little bit about um, kind of some of the benefits, uh, what you can expect as you start to add some diffusion, add some uh, absorption uh, panels. Uh, let's go to um, a little bit of room design because I think if you take this concept to its logical conclusion that reflections are not good because they muddy up the sound, what if I had a dedicated listening room or a dedicated theater? How should I think about the design of that space differently than I would a traditional be like bedroom, living room, 
bathroom, you know, that kind of an idea. How am I taking the sound and incorporating that into the room design? Sure, sure. So in a dedicated space, whether it's, you know, this can kind of go both ways for dedicated listening or dedicated theater, is you are typically designing around a a specified listening position, right? So you know, hey, I'm going to have three theater seats here on the front row and I'm going to have four seats on the back row and that those locations are going to be, you know, four foot off the back wall and three feet from the side wall. So now we can design not just where those acoustic panels are going to go, but where the speakers are going to be placed as well in order to get the actual or proper direction that we want and the proper performance, the exact performance that we want to. You know, I know we talked about in the last episode that you could have a receiver kind of calibrate for some of those imperfections. This is ultimately going to achieve the receiver not needing to to do that other than just some minor calibration, some minor room correction or, you know, something along the lines with the specific speakers that you have. But, you know, ultimately it's it's when we design with acoustic panels and, and mine and one of my favorite things that are, that are out there are the um, the 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 it's called a wall mate from one of our manufacturers that we work with, but essentially yep. it's a fl- floor to ceiling sound panel, but it's acoustically transparent, meaning I can hide the speaker behind it, and now I'm just thinking I'm I'm not just thinking about the sound itself, I'm thinking about the full aesthetics of the space. Um, so you can kind of. I mean, you're you're ultimately trying to achieve that perfect space to where you don't have to calibrate. Yep, if that makes and sense. I'm, a thousand percent, and I'm glad you you brought it up that way because there's this idea of um, <laughs> when you go back and and talk to pro audio guys or pro video guys, whenever you're making a show, making a movie, you know, doing an, a, a commercial, whatever it happens to be, uh, there's this famous saying. It's called "fix it in post." Yep. And yep. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're sitting there, uh, let's say you're making a record and, you know, somebody makes a mistake, you know, the drummer hits a cymbal when he shouldn't have or something along those lines or guitar player, you know, sing, you know, plays the wrong note. Well, is there a tool in software that you can go back afterwards and quote unquote fix the mistake? And the answer is yeah, if you want to spend a few hours and, you know, go in and do some surgery and all this other kind of stuff, yeah, you could technically fix that later, okay? And sometimes you have to. I get that. Pro guys will go, yeah, of course. Like, you know, we don't, but they all will say the exact same thing, which is, I hate fix it in post. Why didn't we just get it right the first time? (laughs) Yep. Why didn't we just play the song right? Why didn't we just act the scene correctly? Why didn't we just deliver the line the way it should have been instead of having to come back in and re-record the dialogue. Like let's just do it right the first time. And so if you can get the room to do it, that means there's no software necessary. And so in theory, we're actually just going to get the best possible performance because we don't get any potential errors or delays from the processing. And so this Mm -hmm. may seem like a very subtle thing. And in a sense, yeah, you got to hit maybe 30, $40,000 worth of theater equipment and investment to where you're going to start noticing the differences there. But honestly, I did a room for a guy we calibrated and it's, I want to say it was like a $7,000 theater system. It, mm-hmm. There was some money there, but it wasn't crazy. And we turned off the Denon calibration and we did the math and we went through and with a measuring tape and we calibrated the room back to a dedicated listening room. And it sounded awesome. It was like night and day. It was like, I can't believe this sounds as good as it does. And all we did is just use physics, right? We just looked at the reality of the situation in the space and, and kind of went with it. Right, right. Now, I love that you brought up that, that fix it and post thing because it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where when I was in college, you know, I went to school for audio engineering and you know, we, we were doing post-production for uh, uh, a movie trailer. Yep. And one of my guys was like, hey, uh, you know, we had, we had went outside to record some sounds. And uh, he decided to uh, make some noise in the middle of us recording. And he was like, oh, we can just go in and edit that out. And we did. We tried to do that. And we ended up having to re-record it. 
because you could no matter <laughs> it sounded so robotic because it, it was it was I mean it was, our our trailer was like I don't know what it doesn't matter it was a bunch of rocks crumbling and that's the noise we were making and you could not cut his voice out of it so uh, do it right the first time is definitely uh, the best way to do it yeah well and I think the uh, the next part of that is um, thinking about reflection points. Thinking about the room, designing it for a specific listening location, you can sort of now think about the way that you could build or alter your walls. And so this is going to go maybe to a level beyond what the average person is going to be willing to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, you think about from a design perspective, if you're going to invest, you know, five to ten grand in a projector, let's say you put five grand into a screen. And you do a nice surround sound system with uh, just a receiver, not separates or anything crazy. Um, and you put together a nice little theater room and you put in, let's say, fifteen to $20,000, right? What is the cost really to doing a little bit of construction, especially if it's part of a remodel anyway, right? And so right, right. I, I just, I just want to kind of plant this idea. It's actually not as crazy as it might seem. If I'm redoing a bonus room or I'm redoing a basement, you may consider making some walls not parallel. And the idea is that you eliminate a potential uh, echo problem of zingingness, right? It's where you get this reflection that just bounces between these parallel walls. And all that happens is you get this little zing at the end of every particular sound. It's not coming off the speaker. It was never part of the original recording, but if you were to just adjust a couple of walls by a couple inches, that eliminates this parallel problem, and so a lot of acoustic issues literally just disappear. So uh, you'll see this all the time in professional recording studios to the nth degree. I think we just miss an opportunity in remodels to uh, maybe make something intentionally a little crooked to give us the best audio uh, experience possible. I agree. No, I agree 100%. Um, you know, I, I always, I actually, when we moved into my town home, I'm on a second floor right now, but as you go towards the front door, it opens up into essentially just a big open ceiling. Um, and there's a window right above my front door as you go downstairs, but it's two parallel walls and then a, another hard surface wall at the end um, and I would show Hallie, I'm like, listen to how terrible this sounds. Cause she would complain about hearing, uh, you know, reflections from me playing games downstairs when she's upstairs going to bed. And I would be like, well, this is the problem. And I would just clap my hands. And when you do that, you'd hear this, that zing that you, that you described. And she was like, how can we fix that? I'm like, well, we would need to do all this. And she's like, uh, well, I'll just shut the door. That was, the, <laughs> that was, that was it. I mean, we have goals, we have goals, but that was not one of them. You yeah. Know? That's yeah, that was different not level of, of goals. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you mentioned doors because, uh, one yep. of the other things that, uh, in all, in all seriousness that, that you can do, uh, is you can create a good seal, right? So, um, we go back to that idea of the wave, right? And uh, sound behaving in a very similar way to water. Um, and so I like to tell folks that a room is a lot like a Ziploc bag full of water, right? And what happens if you punch a hole in that bag? Well, all that water is just going to leak right out. Uh, so how would I uh, fix um, some of those areas where, like, you may have doors or windows or things like that? Uh, what should you focus on uh, to help eliminate that leakage uh, problem that uh, that can occur in some rooms? Sure, sure. So the door is uh, the door is ultimately your biggest enemy in, in a, a dedicated space, right? Um, because it's it's usually going to have uh, a, a, a space underneath it where it's got to clear the carpet or something along those lines this is the door jam for a normal door from a, you know, a, a normal builder is just going to, you know, essentially cover two sides and then you've got a header at the top, but the bottom is typically just open for your floor. So 
Um, most of your sound uh, acoustically train or sorry acoustic companies that are going to make manufacture products are going to make a soundproof door. Um, now, why is that different from any other door? Well, typically it's going to ship inside of its its door sill already. Yep. So, and it's going to be uh, sealed all the way around. So, th- think of it like. Um, you know, when you open the door, there's actually going to be a track at the bottom that the door seals into. So when you open and shut that door, it's airtight when you close it. Um, what does that mean? It means that there's not going to be any sound escaping underneath that door and into the space. Um, just pulling up the specs of one of the other ones that we that we carry, uh, one of them is two and three quarter inches, but it's 13 layers of wood. Right. Totally solid. Totally solid versus the hollow door that you see hanging on the wall behind me that sounds like, uh, you know, a, a, a wood box because it's just it's just a hollow frame for the most part. Like there's or, you know, there's not a lot of quality put into that. No offense yep. to my builder. Uh, but <laughs> um, And, you know, other things like the hinges and, you know, typically are a little bit more heavy duty and uh, they weigh substantially more. I mean, it's like it's uh, I mean, I want to say they're. You know, several hundred pounds in some cases, depending on what what variation you go to. Yep. And again, like you think about the cost of of that type of a door, and I think they range uh, depending on some of the variations. uh, But we'll say between two and five thousand dollars. So I want to go back to our uh, conversation real quick about the theater room that we invested into. Okay. So you do a system. Let's say you spend fifteen to twenty grand. And you're looking at how do I upgrade that system? Well, you don't want to rebuy your projector. You're not going to rebuy your screen. You're not going to rebuy your speakers. They all work and do what they're supposed to do. And that's a long-term purchase. But you could be looking at maybe disconnecting that system and making an adjustment to the walls. Or you could be looking at that door in the back of the room and redoing that and giving yourself a better seal now all the way around the room. Again, kind of allowing the room to be considered a piece of gear. I'm upgrading my system because I'm upgrading my room. That's really like the the, the tone of this conversation. Um, and there's some things that happen as a result of that that you may not expect. As you make the room quieter, you start to hear the noise of the gear itself a lot louder because you're no longer fighting, right? with the sound of the fridge or the air conditioner or some of these other things. And so you can really hear a lot more about uh, uh, of the noise that the cable introduced or the noise the amp introduced. And all of a sudden you start realizing like, oh, well, that's why we put the Furman in. That's why we put the audio quest power conditioner and cables in and all those all the stuff all of a sudden all that stuff becomes a lot more important and so those become the next places that you can start to upgrade and really improve the quality of sound uh because you're eliminating that noise right and and that right. distortion all right so uh what are some uh really cool types of uh, acoustic panels um, that uh, you have as an available option. Uh, I know that uh, some you can get uh, more like a, a wall art, but then there's also ones that are like Starfield ceilings and things like that. Um, yeah. Maybe talk to, talk to us a little bit about some of those uh, options and, 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 and what people might be uh, on the lookout for as they continue to make tweaks and upgrades for their room. Right, right. Well, you know, one of the biggest things that, that, I would run into when we're talking about um, when we were talking about diffusers or absorbers or any type of sound treatment in our in our store would be the first thing would be like oh well, I don't like the look of that that's not gonna <laughs> match that's not gonna match this aesthetic that I have going on or whatever it is that we're going for and then I was like you'd be like well hey go ahead and sit down let's do a demo and we'll listen to it we'll listen to the system and then I'd be like okay hey where are the speakers. And in our old space, that before we had our remodel recently, you could see two speakers in this room, and they were in the ceiling. So usually they'd point those out, but I would then tell them, hey, there's it's a 7.2 in this space. There are seven speakers in this room. Um, so you found two of them. Where are the others? And 
Uh, two of them were actually directly to their left and right behind a piece of wall art that was acoustically transparent. Uh, and mind blown immediately, right? But what do you mean? I can hide the speakers. I don't need to see it. But I can, you know, still provide some sort of acoustic uh, uh, performance upgrade to my space. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the great thing about, you know, a lot of our vendors is that they will work with you um, to customize this to your space. So uh, I mentioned the wall mates earlier. It, you can, depending on the fabric costs, get that to match some of the fabric that's in the room. If there's seating that you wanted to match, you know, if you've done like a, a specific uh, material on your, your, your couch or your chair or, or you want to have it be, look like hardwood, you can do that as well. I mean, there's so many different options. And then you brought up Starfield ceiling, like ultimate, ultimate flex goal there, right? Like I would love, <laughs> I would love to be able to walk into a space in my home and have that. Not only does it, is it the coolest thing that's out there, but it provides a lot of acoustic uh, benefits because it's essentially uh, an inch, inch and a half thick panel that uh, you have multiple of them that get placed together. So you're going to eliminate the reflection points almost entirely from your ceiling and then it also allows your in-ceiling speakers to pass through them. So a lot of benefits there. Um, yep. You get the cool factor and the, hey, it sounds better, there's less noise factor. Yep, absolutely. And uh, I wish that I could do more ceiling panels in more rooms. And I see this all the time in new construction. Uh, everybody's got an open concept. You know, we did a job not too long ago and... Uh, I want to say it was like an 80 foot span between these three or four rooms. By the time it was all said and done, the whole length of the house is one giant long open concept. Amazing for design. I get it. Everybody feels open and light and connected and all of those benefits I, I think are wonderful. But uh, at the same time, your sound just continues to travel and travel and travel. And so, uh, there's some things that uh, I think acoustic panels, especially if you can get them to match your aesthetic, work with your designer, work with your integrator. Let's have that conversation about this is what we're going for from an aesthetic perspective. How can we just work with that? Let's have some synergy and make the acoustic panels work with the space. Um, and you'll find that now you're getting the benefit of the correct aesthetic and you're getting the benefit of the audio uh, being improved and that's creating a more calm space you know my wife and I we have four kids and you know when they get a little rambunctious which I love them but they start going and it gets loud real fast <laughs> and it's like you know we have <laughs> I, I kid you not we have we put panels in the room uh, in the living room and uh, it changed the entire space the whole vibe of the living room was completely different because we didn't have this cacophony of everybody talking and the kids are playing and, and, and it's like, no, like it's just calm and quiet. And it really does help to produce a completely different approach to the house. So, all right, uh, to finish up, let's say we're doing um, a new construction or a remodel. Um, what are some things that you could uh, take a look at um, that uh, might be good ideas for uh, either noise reduction um, in you know particular rooms where you do have the ability to maybe get behind the drywall um, and uh, and do some things? Sure. So um, that's it's one of the things that actually this earlier this year I had a theater we were working on. And it was a complete retro, so, I mean, it wasn't a new build, but they were essentially tearing down most of the room and starting over, um, actually reframing some of the walls to, to square out this room because it was kind of like an L-shaped room originally where the, the previous owner had their entertainment space. Um, and that, the question came up, like, hey, what can we do to just eliminate some of the sound, the, the vibrations across this space? So went with one of my vend went with one of our vendors, great great company to work with, honestly, and you know they recommended adding you know um, what's called green glue 
which is yep. a absorbent uh, or a, a sound absorbent material that essentially goes in between your studs and your drywall, and then also multiple layers of drywall in some cases, um, depending on you know the type of sound isolation that you're looking for. That was where we started. Um, we actually ended up framing part of the room to be uh, to not attach to the uh, parts of the room above it. We only, we hit we were able to work with their architect and eliminate some of those attachment points that you would just see in standard construction to eliminate vibrations from the subwoofers that were in the wall. Uh, so it was actually pretty awesome uh, what we and the contractor we were working with that was doing the remodel were able to do um, just with some additional drywall and you know some thinking outside the box as far as the architecture and construction went. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, it was it was pretty sweet. It was pretty sweet. Um, you know, and then you know we've talked about we've talked about panels. There's like wood wool panels. There's other things that you can put in a space um, after construction, um, which are pretty sweet. And uh, there's also um, material that you can put in that's like kind of takes the place of your insulation. It is insulation, but it's like rock wool. So you put it in the walls, and it just kind of eliminates some of those uh, that sound transfer between sud bays. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up the insulation because that's really the thing is if you can get the wall sealed, right? Yep. Just like we talked about before, that really does uh, give you the ability to eliminate that, that sound transfer. And I'm really glad you brought up the base because that's the number one thing that everybody hears, right? You turn the sub yep. on, you turn the system up, and those frequencies are so long and so tall and there's so much energy behind them that they're going all over the place, right? Um and we did a job, I want to say, just a couple months ago, and we put in uh, these uh, retro uh, back boxes, and essentially what they are is uh, cabinets. They're completely made out of MDF, um, and the in-wall speakers were able to go into those, and the whole concept there was on the other side was the daughter's bedroom. And so the client was going, I want to be able to watch a movie and not wake up my kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like and so it's like well we need physical material to go in place um and just regular insulation doesn't do really enough you do want to go just that extra step go to a specialty product and you're not just going to improve by 5% right even though there might be a 5% increase in cost you're going to get a 75 to 100 percent difference in performance um yep. without having to go that much further down the rabbit trail you're not spending double to get double you're spending maybe an extra 10 or 20 percent and you're going to get double or triple the performance out of it because uh, acoustic manufacturers and acoustic vendors these guys understand that the devil's in the details but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to break the bank to get there you do have to be intentional you got to know yep. what you're doing but you don't have to to spend a bajillion dollars uh, to get there. So, all right. Well, uh, I think uh, we've just about covered most things with acoustics. I'm sure it'll come up again. <laughs> I'm sure. And, and sure uh, there's a lot more of, uh, of a science to it. So I do recommend that uh, once you kind of get the categories, once you sort of get the ideas into your brain, work with your integrator, work with your designer, uh, give yourself the time and space to maybe have some of those conversations to really make sure you're maximizing the room. Even if it's not the first go around, it can be six months later. It can be a year later and you can still add a, uh, a benefit to uh, to your room. Yep. So, yep. Speaking of, <laughs> you know, I got to leave that in now, right? <laughs> yes, yes. It's trick or treat, and I have all the lights off at the front of my house. I, if you're watching the video, you'll notice I was looking down at my phone. My dogs were kind of losing their mind, but I've turned all the lights out, and apparently, we're still getting trick or treaters. Folks. I guess so. Normally, we don't. It's kind of weird. Um, oh, no, I, one of the things I was going to bring up, I mean, since we're talking about it and we were talking about Starfield ceiling earlier, they now have Starfield ceiling tiles just like the absorbers behind me. So you can just do a, a, a two foot by two foot or a two foot by four foot panel. Uh, oh, and just, just in buy, isolation. Yep. Yep. That is so awesome. like, if I wanted that to be Starry Night, I could, which is pretty sweet. 
Well, and I'm sure so, that also dramatically reduces your cost of entry because instead of talking about, you know, 15 to 20 grand to do an entire ceiling, you're talking about the cost of an individual panel. And so yep. you can make that or maybe you do a, a string of them, you know, two or three or something like that. And so it becomes a, yep. a nice to have. I get it. It's not a need to have maybe at, at first, but that yep. becomes, you know, a really nice upgrade. Um you know, so that's that is awesome. I didn't know they did I've this. Sum, I just submitted for a quote. We're gonna see. Check in on the next episode, and we'll we'll let you know <laughs> what the cost was. And I should <laughs> ask: Has anybody discovered who your favorite band is? I I don't know. I didn't uh, I didn't see the messages. What what are you'll have to show me. We'll have to look and see. Did they? Guys, guys, reach out to Mark. Blow him up. <laughs> I didn't get any direct messages, but I didn't know if we if uh, we, you got any from our main account. I did not. I did not. So get out. We have a we have a challenge to the listener. Please blow up Mark. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, communicate with me. <laughs> yes. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I would like to say thank you very much for listening to the Sound of Design with Mark and Dan. Uh, please like, comment, and subscribe, share with your friends, and uh, we will see you guys on the next episode. See ya.